One of the most important things in any randomised controlled trial, I'm going to talk a little bit generally and then move on to the randomised controlled trials for cannabis, looking at pitfalls of randomised controlled trials as well. Um, so the minimally clinically important difference, and I'll stress this, is very important because when we do a randomised controlled trial, we don't want to just know statistical significance because if I'm setting the trial, then I can set the statistical significance at whatever I like. So I can say, oh, okay, we just want to know about half a point out of 10 in the pain score. But that's pretty meaningless. And as I said before, 30% reduction in the pain score out of 10, or 1.5 to 2 out of 10, are the minimally clinically important differences in randomized controlled trials. Now, why do we do randomized controlled trials? Basically, we want to reduce the effects of chance and so we want to put one person here and one person here by randomization. Sometimes if you're the clinician and you decide who goes in which arm, someone could come to you and they come to you with very severe pain and you sort of think, oh, geez, this guy's desperate, or this woman, I really need to put them in the active arm. And so that's why you randomize it somewhere else and you basically give an envelope or whichever way to make sure that the groups are evenly split. So we want the groups to be evenly split in terms of their age, sex, um, their pain scores and things like that right at the beginning. And we're basically comp comparing two groups. And the difference between, and I'll go for turmeric again, <laughs> for any of you who take turmeric out there or any other non-medicinal product uh, from the herbal shops, basically is that they haven't usually been tested against the placebo. So we haven't tested that against chalk and seeing if it's slightly better or not, which is what we do with medicines. And that's, for me, that's quite a big thing because, you know, a lot of things cost a lot of money to my patients and I sort of, and they're taking lots and lots of different things, you know, some medicinal and some basically vitamin mineral type of things. And it's a real concern. I say to people, look, if it costs you $10 a month, yeah, go for it, try it you might get a bit of placebo and you might feel a lot better, great. If it costs $50 a month, you're probably better off going to a holiday in Fiji every year. So here's a trial um, for Sativex. And, I want to, and basically we split them into two groups by randomization and we look at some of their stats. And all we want to do in randomization is to make sure they're approximately even. So there's a lot of problems with randomised controlled trials as well. And Giles alluded to this earlier that it's been basically since about the 1930s and 40s illegal. And so it's very difficult to do RCTs with illegal products. Obviously the um, hoops you've got to go through to ensure that it's kept safely, um, you know, distributed disposed of and probably the it's hard enough doing a randomized control trial that's not <laughs> illegal <laughs> and once you go to a product that's illegal the hoops are just a lot more it gets a lot more difficult and hence there's actually quite a few more trials sort of in the last five-ish years that seem to be coming out and I think as the space changes we'll see more trials now one of the <laughs> one of the real pet hates actually that I have about randomized control trials is um, what we're doing is we're testing usually one condition. Let's well, let's take low back pain because it's nice and easy. So you know we're, we're testing one condition and we often have one treatment, and then we have a control. So the fact is, if we get a population with low back pain, basically these patients might have a bit of hip pain, sacroiliac joint pain, disc pain facet joint pain, made a bit of ligament problem and in fact this exact thing happened to me, I started a randomised control trial in Wellington a couple of years ago and we were looking at anyone with low back pain over six months duration, so very chronic. And one of the things we did in this trial that's never been done that I've seen in a low back trial is we actually excluded people with hip pain. And so there's certain tests you can do and certain uh, radiography you can do to exclude hip pain. So as we imagine in the big wide world, people can have low back pain from discs, but some people are also going to have hip pain. 
and some people are also going to have SI joint pain. And what actually happened in this trial is that more than half the people who came along, we had to exclude them because they had signs, symptoms and radiology that pointed to hip pain as a coexisting diagnosis. Now let's take that a little further. So if I get, so if I don't exclude hip pain and I'm doing an RCT of say, let's say traction for just low back pain, only the people with disc problems are going to be helped and there's going to be a whole lot of other people who aren't going to be helped. So my results are going to be very skewed. So it's really nice to do a trial where we have a specific diagnosis and the nine trials that show 60% reductions in pain on average <coughs> all have MRI scans which show disc problems. So it's more homogenous. So <laughs> when we're dealing with RCTs, we're going to get a lot of negative RCTs if we have a heterogeneous population to start with. So, you know, it's not just, you know, systematic reviews are not good enough, really, when you look at it. You really have to go back through all the trials and just to get a feeling for things. Numbers, uh, problem, neuropathic pain. I mean, how many people have one person in their practice with neuropathic pain or two? How many have none? at the moment. How many have five? Put your hand right up. Yeah, so this, you know, it's not that common. So we're not going to get, I mean, they're probably overseas in Europe, they'll get larger populations, so larger studies can be done. Because that's one of our criticisms. Ah, oh, small studies, they're no good. And generally speaking, small studies are no good in part because the chances, the, ch the risks are higher of chance taking hold. So you might get a couple of people that do really well in the active treatment arm, and that'll skew, skew your trial by maybe 10, 15%, just by chance. So the, the, that's why the bigger the studies, often the effect size is less. And that's why you tend to believe them a bit more. Industry sponsorship, it's a huge problem. And we only no, need to look at antidepressants um, where, you know, they basically, all the trials that show positive benefit, you know, they, they go to publication. Some of the trials done by Big Pharma just get swept under the carpet, don't want to know about those. And really all you have to do is to prove to the funding agencies that there is some benefit over placebo, right? So we've got a, a big problem with vested interest. And the same thing is for cannabis, you know, it's $500 to $1,000 a month or a pottle, and it's big money. And, you know, and what's going to happen is they're going to do more trials and then pharmac are going to be asked to fund it. And then, you know, we're going to start prescribing to everyone and the bill's just going to go right up. And this is where we're a very little country. So I think, you know, we talk about this, but there's a lot of vested interest and a lot of money to be made. In systematic reviews, if our clinical trials have problems, it's a very difficult to synthesise them all and get one result, I think, sometimes. So let's take a trial for multiple sclerosis with central pain. So how do you diagnose that? Is there a gold standard? Can we do a scan and say, yep, do an MRI scan of the brain and say, yep, you've got MS with central pain? Or do people with MS get back pain from discs, hip pain, neck pain? Obviously they do. Abdominal pain. So, yeah, I, I, I don't like that. Because we don't have a homogenous population. And it's very hard to exclude people with all the other pains to turn up with a population. Because a person with multiple sclerosis is subject to the same human problems that we all are in terms of pain. And so the variable sample leads to problems. <coughs> it was a big study as well, over 300 people, 140 in each group. So you know, that to me is a very good sized study. You know, I'd sort of tend to look at that and think, hmm, yeah, that's worth a look. And basically 30% reductions in pain. Um, and in the active group, 50%. In the placebo group, which basically would have water, 
to smell and taste the same as the other group. And the great thing about sprays and tablets is you can package them up to look exactly the same. No one knows the difference. The clinicians don't know the difference and the patients don't know the difference. That's called double blind. Easy. And, but the results are very similar. 45% of the people taking just the water spray got better. <laughs> so, you know, one of the problems with this trial is that you've got a heterogeneous group to start with. And placebo is a big player too. So there's a few problems. Now, neuropathic pain is what I'm going to concentrate in a little bit of cancer pain later on. But as I said before, neuropathic pain is, is not nice. It's basically constant, unremitting, often six you know, out of ten plus, it's often severe, and you can't have any respite despite position or doing anything. So it's one of those pains that is difficult to treat at best, and Constantine saw at least five pain specialists in Sydney, had the CBT and psychologist and tried all the medicines. It's not like he didn't try. You know, he's, he's sort of been, uh, they've, they've got a big pain team in Sydney and he saw them all. And he comes here with six to 10 out of 10 pain, not sleeping. Uh, he actually had a little bit of spinal pain too, as well as his neuropathic pain from his arms. So we actually treated that with posture like we would any normal person. And then his spinal pain reduced and he was left with the arm symptoms. So, You've got to look around the person as well, because not everyone's going to have just neuropathic pain and no other pain either. So, and allodynia is hypersensitivity. So basically, to touch it should never be painful. And basically, when that sensation becomes painful, we've got a problem with our nervous system, and that's and so we can type these people by looking for allodynia. So in neuropathic pain, and the first study looks at a group with post-hepatic neurologia, peripheral neuropathy, focal nerve lesions, radiculopathy, and I saw a case yesterday, I don't know if Bruce sent it in, but it was a patient who had an L5S1 disc fusion um, maybe five, six years ago, um, had a lot of pain down the leg and had a narrow disc and came into me with still a lot of leg pain and had the fusion. Now I was thinking about this patient and I actually think um, she's got some weakness in her foot, some sensory changes, and she might actually have um, a, a radicular pain where her nerve root was compressed so much from the initial disc prolapse that it's continued generating pain signals. Because normally a patient with a narrow disc, a single narrow disc, if you fuse that, they tend to do reasonably well if well selected and yet this patient has had ongoing pain, so they even took the metalware out and she's still the same, nine out of 10 pain. So, you know, that patient, and she had no other disc levels that were altered, so for that patient, she may have, in fact, a you know, a neuropathic pain from her nerve root. And, and so that pigeonholes her quite very different in terms of my looking at treating her. It's really looking at medicines and then trialing, going through the 10 or 20 medications that are available, and maybe towards medicinal cannabinoids, you know, but that's far down, down the track. And complex regional pain syndrome, which is when you damage a nerve and you get pain, so it's neuropathic pain. So small trials in themselves are troubled because of the, the problem with chance. The risk of chance skewing a trial is much greater. Secondly, they tend to give better results, I think. When you, when on the whole, when you look at smaller trials, you think, oh, yeah, wow, that's a really good benefit. And then when you get larger trials, they tend to dampen that benefit. But all the same, if we've only got small trials, really good to look at the flavour of something. You know, if you've got 10 small trials, what do they all show? Do half of them show no benefit and half of them show some benefit? Uh, then it doesn't help at all. But let's say eight, nine show about the similar benefits and one or two show no benefit. Then you've got to think, ah, oh, there might be something in there. Right? So I think. So this is a small trial of 28 people. And in the, this is smoke cannabis. 37% um, had rather f the pain reduction in the cannabis group was 37% versus placebo at 8.6%. So this is relatively a good result. 
And here's another one. And basically, this trial showed a 22% reduction in pain intensity. And 1.49 out of 10 is still probably where someone will say, I feel better. So that's a reasonable result as well. Now here's a larger trial. This is uh, um, 303 people enrolled. And I think the good thing about larger trials is you can start following people through the flow chart. So that way you start getting a little bit of sense of, okay, we've got 100 people with peripheral neuropathy or neuropathic pain. How many are actually going to benefit possibly from this medication, right? That's, that's when it starts getting a little bit more interesting. So as we see, there's 128 people in each group, or 118, 128. And out of this, 50 people, you know, 49 people withdrew. So, you know, this may be similar to our practices. We may get this group of people. We don't have 128, any of us, hopefully. <laughs> Thank God, <laughs> with neuropathic pain. And some, you know, twice as many were lost to stop taking it because of side effects as well in the cannabis group versus the other group. And then we had 79 completed. And, oh, so I did change the slide, my apologies, that's the wrong slide, but 28% versus 16%. So 28% with the active medicinal cannabis responded and 16% of the other group. So what we're seeing here is maybe 34 out of the 126 from the cannabis group may respond, right? It's not a huge number. They, will, they, they had a 30% reduction in their pain. But like the video I showed earlier, you know, their lives are very difficult. And if you can make a difference to 28 out of 100 people, I think that's pretty damn good. And we can look at it another way, because in our practices we don't have placebo, right? We actually don't have placebo, we, we don't give it. So I think one way we can look at that is half the people who continued taking cannabis and who could tolerate it got a benefit. It's another way to look at it, and I think it's a reasonable way to look at it as well. And so like with anything, like with amitriptyline, we prescribe it. X number of people don't like it, too drowsy other effects, can't take it, and then you know we get left with so many that can take it. And then we see how many of those actually get benefit. So we do not work in a world of RCTs in our practices. And we must remember that. It's really trial and error actually. And some people don't like me saying that, but <laughs> medicine is a trial and error <laughs> actually most of the time. Now, the Cochrane database um, put out a review in 2017, and we tend to believe this a lot more than individual studies, sometimes for better or worse. And this added up nine studies with over 1,400 participants, and basically change the slide, but about 40% responded to active cannabis products, medicinal cannabis, and had a 30% reduction in pain. So it's, it's relatively high, even though placebo was 30%, in our practices we don't use placebo. So we may have up to 4 out of 10 people with neuropathic pain having a reduction in their symptoms, which is clinically important. And cancer pain is another area which I don't think we dispute people with limited lifespans and lots of pain from various mass effects. Uh, and they also have neuropathic pain if the cancer's uh, squashing nerves. And also complications of treatment. And there's a few trials, there's several trials in fact, and they, they do show about the same response. Um, in terms of 30% reductions in pain. So there's 30% response. That's the THC CBD component. 
there's the THC and there's the placebo. So one of the things, the flavor of many of the studies is that it seems to be a combination THC, CBD, seems to help chronic pain, including neuropathic pain, more than CBD alone or THC alone. And there's two or three trials showing this. So I haven't come across a trial that I can remember straight off that for cannabidiol with chronic pain. So at this stage I would say that you know the evidence points towards a CBD THC <coughs> mixture and I think for probably a few reasons. One is and when you think of these two components I, I like to think of it like this that the CBD attaches to receptors and probably reduces electricity. Hence it helps sleep and anxiety and things like that. Whereas the THC activates electricity in the brain and produces euphoria and other things. It's a quite a nice way to look at it. So it's like a drug uh, with two components. One that elevates electricity and one that reduces it. I think that's quite a nice way to look at it. Um, but, you know, I, d I haven't read any trials that show CBD is effective for chronic pain. However, I've had a couple of people that have benefited from CBD alone, but, but very few. And this is the other thing we have to look at. How many people are we going to prescribe to to try and get that benefit? So if we're doing neuropathic pain, are we happy to prescribe CBD THC at $500 a month if we know that 4 out of 10 people may get a 30% reduction? We might be. But are we then happy to prescribe CBD alone if it's only going to be safe? two out of a hundred or five out of a hundred, right? And that's where, as clinicians, we can prescribe, but I think we have to be, um, that's the equation we're looking at every day. And the change from baseline for cancer pain was 1.37, which is reasonably significant, I suspect, if you have cancer pain. Now side effects, and I notice in my practice, and, and I don't have a lot of patients on cannabis and grain will enlighten us a little more having seen a lot more patients. The, the, the Constantine who I had there, he's on one or two sprays only at night because if he takes it during the day, he gets tired. So a lot of the time, this, it's a balance between effect and side effect because they just don't want to be sleeping all day either on, on the medicinal cannabis. And I think somnolence or sleepiness is quite a large side effect. And 60% in long-term studies, around half the people will not tolerate this. So, you know, if we take 100 people, 30% to 40% may tolerate it and get some benefit. And I suspect out of that 30 40%, over another year, some will tolerate that long term and some won't. So as we can see, we're just, we are really talking about small groups of populations that are going to benefit from this long term. But I think it's still important in conditions that are very difficult to treat. Um, now I think the other thing we have to look at is what our studies show about other things, right, you know, that we use. And in comparison studies, it's quite important to just have a look around the space. So here's one for opioids versus antidepressants in neuropathic pain. And you know what we have is 76 randomised. We get 19 drop out in the so people drop out in all sorts of studies. It's not just cannabis specific. It's really for opioids and other things. And the effect size basically 6.2 baseline, 4.4, and tricyclics 5.1. Just to give you a sort of round figures. Now, this study is for rheumatoid arthritis, which is an anti-inflammatory, you know. So, the th sort of three types of pain, there's more. There's like neuropathic pain from nerve damage, there's biomechanical musculoskeletal pain, that ha which has a biomechanical influence. And then there's rheumatoid, rheumatic sort of pain, which is inflammation from our bloodstreams that goes into our joints. 
And you know, rheumatic pain is similar really to neuropathic pain is that you can't really alter it by movement or posture so much because it's from our bloodstream. So here's a trial that showed a 31% reduction in pain for Sativex for rheumatoid arthritis. Pretty reasonable. And when we look at the trials looking at anti-inflammatories, 14 and 17 percent reductions in pain. It's quite interesting, really, in that we would certainly expect anti-inflammatories to give. A, you know, this is only a single trial, so it's, we wouldn't hold our hat on it, but it's quite interesting. So the reduction in pain for people with rheumatoid arthritis in the previous slide was twice as much as what would standard, what would we would call standard therapy. So the take-home points, as before, it's just it's another tool in the toolbox. It's certainly not the panacea for chronic pain at all. I think for neuropathic pain, I think that's where probably the research shows its strength. And, and I suspect that's the space where perhaps funding um, would be appropriate. You know, and I think this is one of our problems that I think we tend to act with our hearts and emotion rather than sometimes fact. And I think it's quite important to back things up, especially when we're all funding it, if it goes through Pharmac and MedSafe, etc., for, for funding for people. But it, the cost is prohibitive at the moment for some, but many people can afford it and, have, and will try it. Thank you very much.